It's under. I, I placed it under. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Maya Kilder. I'm a biology major in the College of Creative Studies, and I work with grad student um, Sunny Hussain in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and Dr. Sami Sami Khan in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and I'm part of the Beckman Scholars Program. And today I'm going to tell you about a seven transmembrane protein called proteoridopsin, and about how oligomerization affects its function. So here I have a little picture of just four proteins complexing together or forming an assembly, and that's what I mean by an oligomer, is an assembly of proteins. Um, so I want you to think back, and I want you to think of a cell, and um, I'd like to imagine a cell as having this kind of outer fortress, um, kind of guarding all the contents inside of the cell that um, make up the machinery that we need for life. Um, and you can see there's little gates in the fortress where you can imagine like a, a person would send a messenger that delivers messages from outside the cell, inside the cell. Um, so here we have a cell that's also guarded by this um, uh, outer membrane. And in order to get messages inside the cell, it has to, they have to interact with these membrane proteins. Um, so today we heard a lot about um, drug delivery in terms of pills, patches, and um, shots. But I want to think of one step deeper and think how does those drugs actually get inside the cells um, to interact with the machinery inside the cells to make you feel less sick. Um, and in order to do so, they have to interact with these membrane proteins in these cells. Uh, so why are we interested in membrane proteins? Uh, for one example, there is a group of membrane proteins called the G-protein coupled receptors, which are seven transmembrane proteins found in nearly every organ system in your body. So what I mean by seven transmembrane is the protein is sitting in the membrane and it also crosses the membrane seven times, like kind of like a string. Um, so here's a schematic of a G protein coupled receptor showing a drug interacting with the receptor, which then sends a message through some sort of chemical signaling inside of the cell. Um, some examples of G protein coupled receptors are the serotonin, dopamine, melatonin receptors. There's a long list and it's hard to choose which ones I want to talk about. Um, I also thought it's interested in some, mute, um, some diseases caused by mutations in G protein coupled receptors, include hypo and hyperthyroidism, several fertility disorders also carcinomas, which are the most common cancer affecting humans. Um, so they cause all sorts of um, diseases, and they're very important. Um, so why don't we know a lot about them? Oh, and it's estimated to be uh, that 40 to 50% of pharmaceutical drugs on the market today actually target these proteins. Um, but we know very little about them. And the real reason is that they're very difficult to study. So you can see they're found in this complex phospholipid bilayer environment where all of these individual lipids are different lengths and sizes with different bends. Um, and so it's really hard to mimic the native environment of these uh, membrane proteins in order to study them. And most people, um, to study them, they actually take them out of the lipid bilayer and um, have them in a solution of basically detergent molecules. And you can see that lipid bi bilayer, um, the, the, when the protein's sitting in lipid bilayer, it's in this kind of planar, flat environment, which is very different from this kind of glob of detergent molecules, nonpolar molecules surrounding the protein. Um, so we really want to know what detergent environment best preserves the native function, does it preserve the native function of the protein. Um, so this is one reason we're difficult to study. Another is these proteins often form complexes. So this is an example of a protein forming a trimer. Um, and we want to know how important is it to maintain these protein-protein contacts. Um, does this trimer, uh, is this trimer important for the protein function? And these are just some of the reasons why membrane proteins are difficult to study. And to kind of put it in perspective, um, this is kind of a graph that I just made up, actually. Um, I went on a protein data bank um, and got basically you can um, type of membrane proteins, and you'll see about 300 proteins come up. And they have about like 85,000 proteins actually solved, so it's a kind of a conservative graph. Um, but that is less than 0.004% of published protein structures are actually membrane proteins. And all of these other ones are the proteins inside the cell that are running on machinery. So we know very little about um, membrane proteins, really just because they're very difficult to study. So for my project, I'm going to be studying proteoridopsin um, as a model to study these G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, we argue it's a, a kind of a model um, to help study these G-protein coupled receptors. The reason being is that it's also a 7 transmembrane protein. Um, they tend to form oligomeric complexes. Um, but proteoridopsin is really easy to express in E. coli compared to these mammalian proteins. We can actually express a lot of it in E. coli. 
and it's one of the few membrane proteins where we actually know its structure. So this makes it kind of a model to help answer some of the fundamental questions behind studying these really complex proteins, um, which are, one, what's the best environment for the proteins, and how does the environment affect the oligomeric state, and also, what about the oligomeric state? How important is it for function? Um, so how do both of these really affect the function of these proteins? So a little bit more about proteoredoxin. It's actually a light-activated proton pump um, found in 80% of marine bacteria. So it's not really like the messengers where they just kind of send a message. It's actually pumping a proton from inside the cell to outside the cell. And this flow of protons actually creates energy for the bacteria. Um, it's also been found in, um, to be primarily monomer and hexamer um, kind of in a variety of environments. So this is showing a hexamer complex. You can see there's six proteins forming this kind of like radial assembly. Um, so this is kind of some, some of what we know about proteoridopsin. And for my results, uh, we compared three different detergent environments um, to see how they affect both the oligomeric state and also the function. So first we found that in these three different um, detergents, uh, we get a very different distribution of oligomeric states. So I don't have any graphs. But uh, the non-ionic non DDM detergent seems to stabilize the hexameric complexes. So in solution, we see about 90% hexamer when we're using this detergent uh, versus this um, slightly different protein, or sorry, slightly, slightly different detergent with this water ionic head group actually um, stabilizes about 50% monomer and 50% hexamer. So it'd be good if you want to compare hexamer to monomer, you might want to choose this detergent. Um, and we also found that this two-chain detergent really stabilizes the monomer protein. So it was interesting that they stabilize different um, ratios of complexes. We also wanted to know, uh, once we separate those complexes, uh, does the different detergent actually, the different detergents actually affect the function of the protein? Um, so I'm going to talk about this graph in the next slide also, so kind of hang in there. But um, we can see on top is basically the monomer protein in all three different detergents. We can see that the monomer in all three detergents pretty much is behaving like a monomer, even though I haven't told you what this curve is. <laughs> and the hexamer in all three detergents is pretty much behaving like a hexamer. Um, so we can kind of conclude that the detergent environment has less of an effect on the function of the protein than it does on the initial ratio of um, oligomeric states. So uh, now I'm going to tell you um, how oligomeric state affects the affects the function of the protein, and um, so we'll go into a little bit more detail about how it actually pumps a proton. Um, so remember, this protein basically has a proton that hops through this channel, and in order for the proton to hop through the channel, it uh, basically jumps from an amino acid, one amino acid to another amino acid. So this first amino acid that jumps onto is just an acidic amino acid that grabs this proton and pumps it through the channel. And we can actually determine um, through a titration experiment, which I'm not going to go into too much detail about, um, we can determine how often is this protonated. So in this form that you see here, the protein is active because this first amino acid that grabbed the proton does not have a proton, so it's ready to accept the proton, so it's in the active state. Um, and we can basically look at uh, what percent of the time is this amino acid protonated as a measure of function. So we did this, and this is the same graph from the last slide. We can see that um, we get monomer pKa value of about 8, and this is suggesting that the monomer form is about 50% active. So that means about 50% of the time there's a proton attached to that amino acid, and 50% of the time it's active, um, ready to pump a proton. And we found that the hexamer is about 90% uh, in active form. And so this basically, uh, to conclude this, we, it was interesting to sh uh, that this show that the oligomeric state really affected the function of the protein. And we can also see that the detergent environment had less of an effect than the oligomeric state on the function of the protein. Uh, that's pretty much it. So to conclude, some detergent environments stabilize monomers more, uh, better than oligomers. And also, oligomeric state has a bigger effect on function than the detergent environment does. Uh, so, so my current, the current work that I'm doing, I'm um, working to reconstitute the protein back into a lipid bilayer, to basically see how, fun, uh, how good is, uh, how, uh, 
how similar is the function when we have it in these micelles to when we have it in a liquid bilayer? Um, can we compare the function in these micelles to what we would see in vivo? Um, and also, we're using a technique called electron paramagnetic, re paramagnetic resonance to determine details of protein dynamics. Um, it's actually a lot of my work that I just didn't have time to get into today. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank my lab. This is Pod Lab. I want to thank my mentor, Sunny Hussain, um, my past mentor, Catherine Stone, who showed me the ropes for Sonia. <laughs> Thanks with that. And then my mentor, and then my uh, PI, Sonny Han. I'd also like to thank Eric Lewin, the Infectious Comic Program, for making everything possible. Okay.